So I'm honoured to have here in the Design Notes virtual studio, Cole Worley. Cole, thank you very much for joining me. It's my pleasure to talk to you again, Ben. So my, my first question, and you know, please, if you if you feel the desire for modesty to bubble up from you, curb that desire. Uh, when did you know that you were good at what you do? Oh, I don't know. Um, I think uh, there was a time, let's see, the, the first design work that I did was on variants, and I made a variant for Twilight Imperium. Uh, when I was pretty young, I was probably at the end of high school or somewhere around there. And I remember uh, posting it on Board Game Geek and then waking up the next day and having a few geek messages. People had sent me these private messages on the platform saying how much they liked it. And it was, the f I think it was one of the first times I'd ever done anything and gotten um, a kind word from someone I didn't know. And it was just this very small indication that maybe it, um, maybe there, there was something there. Now, I, I, I never really aspired to be a designer. I kind of stumbled right into it. But uh, I think I, I, I've had a very different road and th that has led me to the, the, these sort of strange little moments. Like when I submitted my, my first design, um, it, 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 was, it was approved within a couple of weeks. And I thought, oh, maybe, maybe I'm better at this than what I thought I was going to be doing <laughs> with my life. And, you know, so you, you started off with variants. And the, the one thing, I'm not a game designer, and the one thing it, it seems to me with game design is it's it's a flash, a spark of inspiration, and then weeks and months and years of iteration and work and sweat. Did you do that kind of work on these variants, or was it just, you know, you're playing the game and thinking, ah, but what if? Uh, a lot of my initial designs hadn't been wor worked on too much. And I, don't, I don't mean like the things that actually got published, but a lot of those variants were mostly just ideas. They were things that worked in the in the abstract that seemed really compelling. And then usually I would play them once or twice and just get a sense if it actually worked. But they weren't, um, they didn't really go through any development. And I'm afraid that they, they show the fact that they didn't go through any development when I look at them now. Um, but oftentimes with most of the projects I'm working on, there is some like key moment where... Um, some kind of conversation, some sort of design element uh, becomes very clear. And then the work of the next often several months or even years is trying to excavate very, excavate very carefully the whole structure. And, you know, you, so you're, you, you said you had an interesting journey. I mean, you flirted with academia, you've got a PhD in English literature. How does someone who, you know, is you know working through Victorian literature end up becoming a game designer then? What was the journey to that? Well, it happened. It happened kind of in fits and starts. And what I think I uh, like, like the rest of the folks and uh, my little siblings, we we grew up in a family that loved making things. So we were always making things. Um, whenever I go home to visit my parents, it's exhausting because they want to throw pottery one day and they want to write something the next day and they want to paint on another different day. Uh, and so whenever I would have any time, uh, and I think one of the thing, odd things about graduates, whenever I'd have any time, I would want to work on a project. And one of the strange things about graduate school, especially in the humanities, is it's a, it's a tremendous amount of work, but you do have these like strange pools of free time where maybe you submitted a big article and now your job is to wait for a month and a half. And you might be teaching, you might have other obligations, but the thing that was preoccupying you that you were really laboring on, you can't work on anymore. Mm. And so what I found was while I was in graduate school, I had these weird pools of time where I would find myself working on games. I just wanted to stay busy. And you know, one, uh, one winter right after my, my first son was born, um, I got it in my head that I really wanted to program a digital platform for <laughs> playing cube railway games. And so I, I taught myself JavaScript and a few uh, other um, libraries and programmed a, a little online version of Dutch Inner City. And it completely took my entire winter. It was like the thing that I was obsessed with. Uh, of course, I can't release it or anything because that, that game is under license. Mm -hmm. um, but one of those winters, one of those pools of time, uh, what led to the creation of, of Pax Premier, my first game. And uh, when I was done with, with, with that work, I realized that I might have made something that um, could be submitted. So I, I submitted it sort of on a lark, um, just sort of wondering, uh, you know, it, it seemed like a compelling game. I, I, would, I would talk about it publicly a little bit and just on forums and things. And people would ask me follow-up questions. I thought, okay, well, maybe there's interest in this. And so I submitted it for publication. It was approved. And then 
because I submitted it to a very small publisher, a little company called Sierra Madre Games, um, anything I could do to help the game along would help them. So I ended up doing the graphic design and the editorial and the, most of the development. And by the end of that summer, I had a, a complete game that was ready, you know, actually by the beginning of the summer, ready to be submitted to the factory and to get published. And it, stepping back a second, I realized that like that whole process, I just enjoyed every minute of it. it and so when the next year came around and uh, the owner of Sierra Madre asked me if I had any other titles I was working on, I said, oh, I have a little expansion. I have this other game I'm working on. And he said, hey, if you just want to keep giving me games, I'll keep publishing them. And so over the course of the undergraduate school, I had this steady stream of historical titles. Um, and what, what I found was, as I started going on to the job market, was that um, you know the academic job market is very difficult right now. Um, there's been a lot of cutbacks, and it's just it's very difficult to break in. Uh, and the game industry is like that too. But I had had more published games than published academic articles, so weirdly, I was in like better footing. Uh, not not that one wants to necessarily have a career in either of those industries, but I had better f footing for for games, and so that was where I kind of uh, I threw my hat in that ring. And so, you know, you, you've spoken about designing these variants and getting geek mails the next day and then doing Pax Premier and it getting received and, you know, having essentially a, an open checkbook to publish games with Sierra Madre. Do you think that you were just born with a natural aptitude for game design or, or do you think, you know, you've had to really, I mean, I guess you've had to hone your craft, but do you think there was just something in you that made you naturally predisposed to it? Well, I, I grew up in a family that loved play, that venerated pr play. Um, and it wasn't, I think sometimes people say that and they mean that like their dad was into video games or like loved like baseball. Uh, they, everyone in my family did everything. We all like, you know, I, we, we had a rule that we often couldn't join sports teams because if we wanted to play football, we had to go find nine friends and mm -hmm. go play it. And so, you know, every evening was like, we're playing hockey or some kind of sport. And then as the weather turned, chess and risk and all the kind of staple, lots of stratego. Um, and so play was just a very important part of, of, of my upbringing. And I never felt like particularly um, like I wanted. So it, it, it's a very strange thing because I, I did have a moment when I was maybe in middle school where I thought I really wanted to be a game designer. But I think every child especially of my generation at that time, wanted to work in games. Hmm. Because, I mean, it's a little bit now when you teach and you ask students what they want to be, they'll say that they want to be YouTubers because right. that's, the, that's the media that they're consuming. And what greater thing than to make the media that you're consuming. Um, but, uh, but I never felt like, I, I never felt like I was, I was made to do it. I think what happened was I always had had this interest in making things. And then one of the big um, skills that I picked up from graduate school was just the ability to run big projects. Hmm. And I, I love, uh, when, I, when I was first going on the job market, I remember my wife asked me like, oh, what kind of job do you want to you know, look for? You don't have to teach necessarily. I said, well, I think I want a job that is really hard because I love working on a hard project. And I also want a job that is project-based. And I think this is a very sterile way to talk about games. Right. But one of the things I love about it is that it a game takes 18 months oftentimes from, you know, inception to holding the finished game in your hands. And they're fiendishly difficult to engineer and build. And uh, they also can be achieved by like a small team of people working on a, working on a project can, can manage it. And so I, you know, whereas a video game to me seems like out of, out of mind, I can't possibly imagine directing 200 people or 300 people in one of these big AAA games. I love the fact that a game can still be built by a small team. Like the, the size of a team mm -hmm. that might be working on a game today, it's very similar to what might have been working on a game 15 or 20 years ago. Right. I find that very pleasing because it, it has this um, sort of arts and crafts uh, character, uh, which I think is, is really interesting. But I also think that, you know, uh, I mean, to answer your question directly, in this case, my, my interest was entirely made. It was entirely the result of my upbringing and the... Um, the, the different kinds of, uh, of of skills that I picked up and the different kinds of challenges that I found compelling as I went through my education. I mean, were you aware? Because I, I, I've interviewed a lot of people, and often they talk about their their childhood playing games, and it it never occurred to them that these were authored things. These were toys that came in a box, 
And it, the, they had a moment of revelation when they thought, oh my god, people actually make these things. There are people who design them. Were you aware, you know, as a kid, that there was a designer, there was an authorial voice behind these things? Well, certainly not. And in fact, I was probably a little dull about this and took far too long realizing that this was an industry that created these things. And I think about two moments. One of them was when I was publishing with Sierra Madre being put on an email group that was talking about a design and having this realization that these games that I had really been digging into were basically being designed by committee with, in these long email chains. And it just did this, it like grounded the designs in this very different way. And then the other, the other moment was right when I started working at Leader Games, I had my very first Gen Con with them. And they let you, um, they let you onto the floor in Gen Con, uh, maybe a couple hours before the the show opens to the public. And I had worked in stage crew in the past, and so I, I recognized the energy. The air was a little, it was electric with that pre-show mm. jitter, uh, and, and it, was, it was fantastic. And as I was walking around, looking at co essentially colleagues talking to each other at their booths and catching up, uh, I realized that this was a living and breathing industry. Uh, that all created this hobby. The hobby didn't kind of like emerge out of thin air. And that, I only really had that realization once I got into the industry. Because before, I mean, especially I think in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, there's something about like the Euro designs of that, of that era that seems so crystalline as if they just emerged fully formed. But, at, you know, I think once you pull the curtain back a little bit, you can see, you know, oh, these are the lines they use to, mm. to, to, to raise the sets and lower the sets. And th these are the little, like, graphic design techniques they're using to create th this particular effect. And, um, and I think that, that element for me, uh, so I think I, I'm, I'm in good company with the rest of those designers, really imagining them as fully formed objects. And then only very late for me coming to understand them as constructed and built by a real human infrastructure that's quite massive. And it's interesting that you talk about that sort of industry and the hobby being created. There's been a reckoning in sport recently. Because of recent events, crowds haven't been in stadiums. And I'm a, I'm a football fan soccer for the, for the American audience. And, you know, the, the, the quantifiable difference in entertainment value between watching a, a football match with a full stadium and an empty stadium is, is incredible. To, mm -hmm. to what degree do you think that the hobby is formed both by the publishers and the players, and especially in a convention coming together and feeding each other? Well, th there's, a, there's a really interesting cost-benefit analysis that's going on right now at a lot of publishers, and le leaders included in that, uh, which is, should we go to conventions? So you can, you can measure how many games you sell at a convention, and you can measure the cost of your booth and the cost of hotels and the staff that you might have to pay, and you can, you can weigh those. Uh, and so, and, and a lot of uh, publishers uh, find that calculation quite lacking. It suggests that these conventions are at, uh, you know, quite, quite, they're operating at quite a loss, especially mm. when you start to figure the opportunity cost of taking your creative staff and asking them to play salespeople, which, you know, some might be, some might love and be good at, and some might be horrible salespeople, uh, and you, you disrupt their work for a week or more. Um, but that analysis leaves off the externalities. And mm. some of those externalities are, that feeling of community, that big spirit, that the excitement of f seeing the hobby in a physical space. So often, our, our you know, gaming is, is very interesting because the, this, you know, if the cellular unit of uh, of a sporting event is the event uh, of sports is is this sporting event in the stadium with the cheering fans, the cellular unit for a, for board gaming is you know six people or five people or four people sitting around a table. Right. And and so it's it's really easy to forget the larger hobby, the larger enthusiasm. And so, you know, you, you can say like, well, we have things like Twitter or Board Game Geek or Instagram and all these, these places where you do see some of the, the community work. But one of the very few places where you see it uh, manifest physically is in convention spaces, right? And I think um, it can be quite healthy. Now, obviously, you know, now because of the pandemic, it's not a great time to be lauding conventions. But, but you know, as hopefully things kind of get back to whatever the new normal is and as these spaces become safe, I, I think people are going to start to recognize how important that kind of manifestation of the hobby in a physical space is. And and I also think, like, this isn't to say that they're, they're, they're perfect spaces. They're far from it. But... Um, 
just being in a room with a hundred people who are excited about the same thing you're excited about is is a powerful as a powerful event. And so, uh, I want to move on now and talk about sort of how you get a game to a table. And and you're quite unique within the game design world in that you're a staffer at a company, but you also run your own publishing company too. So. How do you come from the idea in your head to, you know, terrible players like me sitting around a table losing at PAX Premier embarrassingly? <laughs> and how different is it when designing for Whirly Gig as it is for de designing for Leader? So a lot of the processes are very similar. Um, the main difference is speed. Uh, so I, I'm a staffer at Leader Games and I am one of, uh, you know, a six, team, a six person creative team. And you know th that is the office that I'm sitting in right now. This is a, this is the we're in an active side side of work here, uh, and with Whirly Gig, I'm working with just my brother, and then we have some friends and volunteers who help us at different at different times. And uh, one way to express this difference is just to talk about how different play playtesting is. Um, mm -hmm. If I need to test a mechanism, I can within ten minutes have four people sitting at the table and all of us playing and betting a game. If I'm trying to do the same thing with Whirly Gig, I have to do it on my off time, probably on a weekend. I have to coordinate the weekend schedules with people. It could be two or three weeks before we get that initial test. So there's just a big, a big time delay. Uh, it also, uh, the, um, the initiation of projects is quite different as well. So with Whirly Gig, um, we have a very small but very dedicated audience that I'm grateful to say is happy to sort of like follow the company where it wants to go. And so when I'm thinking about a, a title for Whirly Gig, um, the, the biggest thing I'm trying to think of is my own barometer for, is this a compelling subject? Is this something that is well matched to the audience? Um, and, you know, I, I have a lot of license to kind of do whatever I, I'd like. I can't do quite any topic, but it's allowing me to produce games that I would have a hard time selling to other companies, especially in the kind of productions that, that we're doing. Um, now with, with Leader, it, it's a little different because the audience is a lot bigger. And also the, just the market position of the company is, is totally different. And I know that, you know, if, if a Whirly Gig game stumbles, uh, my brother and I will be okay. Hmm. But um, I have, there's a lot more pressure on a leader games title because there are now 13 or 14 staff members with families, with health insurance, and there's just a lot more riding on any of those games. And that, that leads us to produce titles that are a little bit more in step with, with our audience uh, because we, we don't want to, we don't want to rock the boat necessarily too much. Uh, now, in terms of the initiation of games, like how they, how they really begin, um, at Leader, I usually start by thinking about what are all the games we make right now? And what are places where we can naturally add to that like line or that constellation of games in a way that maintains the studio's identity, but also uh, expands and strengthens all of the existing lines. Now th this sounds like, I feel like I'm a suit saying this, right? Mm. Because this is a very like market first uh, way of thinking about how we do games, but that that logic has informed every product that, that, that we've worked on. And, and it's a good logic too, because basically what it says, uh, and, and there's an important caveat to it, which is we want to make games that we feel like are in areas that just aren't being super well served by the existing market. So like right now I'm working on a science fiction game hmm. uh, and I've wanted to work on a science fiction game for a long time. And I'm sure we, we can talk more about it. But one of the biggest questions I have to answer is why the hell should I make a science fiction game in a world where there are so many science fiction games? And so like on my table over here is just a big stack of science fiction games that I'm playing and I'm thinking about what are the things that I think they're getting right? What are the things that I think they're getting wrong? Is there a meaningful intervention? Is my voice needed in this conversation at all? Or should I be working on something totally different? Uh, because I think a lot of times um, publishers and designers get caught in this trap where they um, they just don't play the sorts of games they want to make hmm. because they're worried about originality or something. And my old Marxist professor would always tell me that originality was a bourgeois conceit, which I loved. Um, <laughs> and that actually you should be thinking about every discourse as dialectic, as a, as, as a conversation. Right. And don't be the jag who walks into a room and just starts shouting whatever's on their mind. Listen to the conversation ask yourself, is my voice needed in this conversation? And then if it is, find like the appropriate intervention. 
And and that that logic is 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 a, true at Whirligig and it's true at Leader. And I, this is a very abstract way of thinking about design, but what what it does is it provides me with a lot of principles for the shape a game could take. And then I start doing concept work on the design. At, at, at that point, I will pull in some people on our production team and say like, hey, here's kind of what I'm thinking about for this title. It doesn't have a name yet. It doesn't have any mechanisms. It's really just like an idea. But I kind of want to understand like, what, what would a budget be like for? What kind of pieces could I put in the game? Hmm. What, you know, what, what kind of shape? What, where might it fit in the schedule? And then once I have those kind of rough rules, just a few design constraints, I go back to my desk and work for months and start actually building building the game and and so it's interesting to hear you i can sense a a, a sort of attention in you when you talk about the business of of the game industry and I, I was having a conversation with some actor friends the other day and we were talking about sort of our roles as actors and i was very keen on saying we are not artists the minute you consider yourself an artist you become self-indulgent you become problematic and you you ruin the experience for everyone else because you you you, you think about your own work above everyone else's work i mean what do you think of yourself as a game designer? Are you an artist? Are you a craftsperson? Are you simply someone trying to fill a niche in a market? Well, I would I would be working on these games even if I couldn't sell them. So that like, and I think that that's a really important kind of element to all this. Like when Drew and I are planning out our, Drew and I are both pessimistic people, my brother Drew. And whenever we're planning out our business plans for any of our history games, we always build them so that as long as we can like get the most basic, like our bread from 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 mm -hmm. the, the title, we'll do it. And we do not maximize for profits or anything like that. Uh, because it's much more important that that the game exists. I mean, the thing is, going back to, to that notion of the conversation, the thing that animates my design practice is that I think that there is this amazing conversation happening about play, about what games can be, about the limits of the kinds of stories, the kinds of arguments that games can make. And I love that conversation. This is the academic in me. And so I want to participate in that conversation. Now, the cost of participating in that conversation means that sometimes I have to go talk to the producers about our budgets and figure out precisely how much we can spend on a game and you know the, the kind of splash that a game might look. Um, it, 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 and that, that can sound like it dirties the whole affair, but to me that it, 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 the, that conversation is a marketplace like any other marketplace and the best actors in the conversation should be sensitive to, um, to the fact that they're just one voice among many and, you know, participation in that marketplace means that you have to, you have to, um, you have to play by the rules and, and the rules that I'm talking about here are rules of, of, of production presentation, things like that. Right. Um, I don't. I don't think too much about like my own identity as as an artist or as a craftsperson. Um, I think that 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 distinction is is fraught with some very like tricky class language. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes like when people are like, "Oh, well, I'm not a craftsperson. I'm an artist." Like when I, when you read, um, I'm reading a lot about the Bloomsbury Group right now, mm -hmm. and nice. I, and I you always feel that hanging in the back, and 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 part of me thinks like. Well, for them, you know, for for this for this group of of uh, of writers and artists in you know uh, Edwardian England, like they were really sensitive to those class distinctions. So if they if they're alienated by the word craftsman, it's because it's also bound up in questions of class. Well, they hated oh, the poor. You yes, uh, sure, yeah, and <laughs> and and also they they hated a lot of things about themselves, right? Um, but. When I think about the artists that really inspire me, they're they're, they're artists that you know, Alistair Gray uh, is, is is one example, or even like you know, in the nineteenth century, like someone like William Morris, who is trying to recapitulate, not recapitulate, is trying to um, re restore dignity to the kind of like craft of building something, right? right? And I, you know, when Drew and I first started Whirly Gig, we um, we had, we built this multi tiered business plan that was like, no matter what happens, we still want to do this, and by that we meant if we funded so poorly that we would have to ship the games to our garage and then mail them out by hand, we would be happy to do that because I sort of love every part of the process. And so it's been interesting talking to, comparing notes with other designers who are in my space because very few people in the world are staff designers. It's just, right. it's a very rare thing. Um, and one of the things that I think is, that I find is, is different between how I approach the work and how they approach the work is 
I love laying out rule books. Like the process of picking a, picking a typeface and building a style sheet and very carefully doing the work of layout, I think it's fantastic. And I, one of the things I love about WhirlyGig is I'm able to go slow and do every single part of the project that I feel like I'm able to do up to the standards of the project. Now at Leader, that, that has changed a little bit and we have a wonderful graphic design staff mm -hmm. and a wonderful marketing staff. But if I were, you know, if I were completely left up to my own devices, I would just want to do the slow work of making games, which I guess to me is it's a craftsman work. And then the, the, the conversation that I want to participate in is the conversation among all the other folks who are slowly making games, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's, that's a very long answer to your question, but that's really kind of how I, how I think through this. And so, you know, when I play your games, they seem unique. And I, I don't just mean thematically, and I don't just mean sort of in the sense of you're designing, you know, asymmetrical games, but there is a, there is a simplicity that belies a complexity, I guess is what I'm trying to say. What for you is the crux? of a good design and do you think for you that differs from other designers in the space i think a lot of designers i talk to especially younger designers are really interested in the notion of fun and they're trying to optimize the experience of playing for the game for like a laugh or a smile or something like that and i think i one of the things I love about games is, as a form to work in is that um, players will, can experience a really wide emotional range. And so sometimes I think about like, don't think about fun, think about joy and know mm -hmm. that people can derive joy from things that are sad, from things that are right. upsetting. You know, I mean, there are, there are albums of music that uh, will always like bring me to utter tears that I think of as profound and beautiful and joyful. And there's just, I think games, you know, maybe not as much as music, but games have a really large expressive range. And so when I am developing, I try not to sand off the edges that are eliciting those kinds of responses. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I, I think that there's probably two things that sort of might contribute to that feeling of the games being a little, a little different. Uh, one is a development, one is a design practice, which is that I, I don't start with any mechanism. I don't say, I want to build an economic game about trains that's a deck builder. Right, and, and that is that is an extremely common starting point. I mean, a lot of times, even in design seminars, people will say like, "You should have maybe an idea for a topic, and then also, what's your mechanical framework?" And I do, I just do not start that way. Instead, I start with a system. How do I want the players to relate to one another? Mm. And and that is sometimes um, a very loose thing. I will. I want players to feel. You know, one of the things about Premiere was I wanted players to. Um, to become more entangled as the game went on and not less entangled, which is typical for political games. And so that sense of like entanglement and having fraught alliances was like, that was, that was the germ of the whole game. Mm. And so because I don't start with a mechanism, it can be very frustrating for playtesters because, you know, one, one week they thought they were on the playtesting team for a deck builder. And then the next week, the deck builder is just gone and it's a rondelle or it's, it's something totally different. And so when I, when I come to actually design a specific mechanism for a game, uh, I, I'm, I, I don't think about it in terms of the traditional genres. And then the second thing is my development practice is really prioritized around um, making sure the game ex strengthens and expands its expressive range. I love it when the game can do very different things from one game to another. And so a lot of times when, when you're working in, in game development, uh, you want to try to uh, find whatever is like the most fun part of the game. And then if this is what the game's doing, you want to be like, okay, let's make it do that so that it always is going to be producing expected results. Now, if you've played Oath, you know that Oath's expressive range is about as wide as it could possibly be. Hmm. Just absolutely strange things can happen in that game. And as we were working on development, if ever we felt the games were starting to feel like samey, I'd say, okay, it's time for a serious intervention. We really need to mix this up or mix that up. Uh, and I think both of those things contribute to, even though I, I think all, all the games that I've done are, are quite different, um, they have a character and it's those two things which inform that character. So I want, I want to talk about something about, about being a designer now. In So I would love to design a game one day and I'm sure I will get some index cards and design something awful at some point. But, you know, what I imagine is the exciting part is when you get the ring on the doorbell and it's the FedEx guy and they've got a box and you open it and you see this finished game in cling film and it's got 
the wonderful art, it's got the name of the game, and it's got your name attached to it. Do you still get that electric thrill from that? And do you get a different free feeling when it's a leader game to when it's a whirly gig game? Uh, it is still thrilling. I was on vacation last week and the pre-production copies of the new Root expansions came in. And keep in mind, I was only one of a number of designers who worked on these products. And I drove in from where, <laughs> from where, <laughs> from where we were because I wanted to see them uh, and, and help review them. And it, it is still, you know, this is probably the 10th or 11th project that I've worked on. And it is still absolutely thrilling. Um, I mean, I was, when we got Oath, I was emotional. I mean, that, that, that game took two and a half years to make three years. It was built largely during a pandemic where mm -hmm. the, there was like a little found family of Oath testers where all of all, you know, everyone's live was, live was in chaos, but we had, we knew that like there was a little discord where these Oath testers from all around the world could gather and talk and, and distract ourselves with the work of working on this game um and uh it, it it's it's always tremendously moving and it doesn't feel you know it, it's not I, I actually don't really even like putting my name on boxes i think it's a it's just a midwestern characteristic that i probably mm. need to, to get over my brother always makes me do it for the whirly gig games i'll always give him the layout files for the box and he's like you didn't put your name on the cover call you have to do that <laughs> and i was like no i don't <laughs> i don't want to um but it when I look at a finished spot, when I look at that first copy in shrink wrap, what fills my mind is not like a pride of having finished it. It's like, it, it's, it's the collective labor that went to its creation. It's, and oftentimes it's just many, many years of, of work. And I am, I would say, especially compared to other people who do this professionally, I'm quite a slow designer. I, mm. I like working on no more than two titles at once and it takes a long time for me to finish them. I had somebody ask me about a follow-up game to John Company. I thought, well, I've been working on John Company for three years, two and a half years. I have another four or five months. And then I'll, I guess I'll start working on the next game, but it, I mean, I'll, I'll see you in 2026. Like <laughs> I, I mean, it's going to take just, to, it'll take a really, really long time to execute these things. And even when I'm working at Leader, uh, where the games take closer to a year, year and a half, that's still just a long time. Um, and so you know, every, uh, every time I'm working on one of these, these projects, uh, when we do actually get it, uh, I, it's just, it's a way of capturing a big part of my own life. I feel like when I look at that box, I see like, wow, that was, that was 18 months for six people. We were obsessed about this little box of cardboard. Um, and I think it, um, it, it's one reason that one of the things I love about working at, here at leader in the studio is that, um, because we have so much control over what we're doing. Uh, we can really pour ourselves into these games. And I never feel guilty about asking for an art piece or asking like, hey, you know, I looked at the graphic design for this. Let's punch it up a little bit. Or like this part of the development's not setting right. Well, let's wait an extra month and really do it properly um, because we're not really worried about trying to publish like five new games every year. Uh, we're really interested in making something that we think is going to last. So I've got two more questions for you then. Okay, fire away. So the, the first one is you're at a convention, you know, conventions are back on. And you, you you go out for dinner, and you're coming back from the loo, and there's there's a table of gamers, and you overhear your name being mentioned in connection with them talking about games. So you you sidle into the corner and you eavesdrop. What do you hope they're saying about you? <laughs> I have a, a habit at BGGCon especially because BGGCon is one of my favorite uh, game conventions uh, because it is so. Um, focused on playing games and not focused on buying games. The main convention hall of BGGCon, it's just game tables. It's not mm. booths, and I, and I, I adore it. Um, but if I'm if I see people playing one of my games, especially one of those games, I, one of the games I don't often see people playing, uh, sometimes I will sit at the table or I will s sort of like hang out and just like ask if I can listen. I never identify myself, uh, mm. and I and I just I like to, I like to listen and. What I am trying to, I, I want to see them. I, I hope they're not talking about me. I hope they're talking about the game. And I hope that they are finding themselves utterly engrossed. When I, uh, there was a game of Oath I walked by once. Uh, and I, have, I haven't had very many opportunities to walk by a game of Oath because there hasn't been, hasn't been much reason to it. But I was at a game store. They have, there happened to be a group playing it. And they were shouting at each other uh, good-naturedly. 
and that is that's the sound that i want to mm. hear that full immersion into the game that to me is that, that's music and so the final question then why is gaming good i think i think gaming is good and i mean good in the the most capital G way possible, gaming as a moral good, uh, because I think it exposes players to a wide variety of different positions. And I mean that in the sense that when you play a game, uh, you can have a really rotten game. You could have horrible things happen to you and you can feel what that feels like you can experience a different position of sympathy and likewise you can experience dramatic turns of fate i mean i think that that like that that sense of transportation in games that it's almost like um you know it's funny i i used to use a lot of literary uh literary theory when i talked about games and i'm finding myself using more um drama theory and mm -hmm. especially around uh theory around improvisation because I think that in some ways games are, it's almost, they're almost like improv games where there are rules established, but the players are writing the script as they're performing it. And I think that sense of transportation is, is so critical. And, and especially when it comes to the type of games I'm working on, which have specific arguments often about social and political and cultural uh, histories or theories. Um, the ability to take a player and transport them to a different context and say, hey, you know, if you've ever wondered how something like Empire could take root, this game will help you understand that. And mm. I, I don't want, like, you know, I, I want players in the same way that, um, you know, hopefully just presenting it isn't necessarily an, an endorsement, of course, right? Like, I think John Company is a very interesting example of this because so much of the game is about culpability and about the consequences of even well-intentioned actions and also the consequences of actions that are not well-intentioned. And I, I, I love it when, when players walk away from a game and say like, wow, I like want to read a book on this subject. I'm like, so, yeah. you know, I, I, I actually, I want to play the game again and understand it from a different perspective. And they find their, um, their sense of the world kind of deepen. And the, the other little example of this is, is uh, recently to the, the filming of this interview, um, we watched the, the process of the U S withdrawal in Afghanistan. And I got mm. so many messages from people, um, thanking me for working on Pax Premier, which gave them just a very different sense of, of the stakes of what was happening in, in the present moment and just a deeper understanding. And I'm not, I'm not here to proselytize any particular position, but uh, I find it immensely gratifying that I gave folks, hopefully, or the game really, not not just me, gave them some some new terms and some new, different frames of reference for thinking through like a, a contemporary political event. I think that that's really remarkable, and um, that 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 happens in sort of like stuffy, self serious games about Afghanistan, but it also happens in Spot It or you know or yeah. Apples to Apples. Like I mean, even uh, there there are transcendent moments in a game of skull that can be just as profound as anything in a game of here i stand mm -hmm. and i think the fact that the hobby can encompass both of those experiences is really really remarkable and it makes it very easy for me to show up at work every day brilliant well cole worthy thank you very much for giving over your time it was absolutely my pleasure ben thank you for having me